just before we get the panels here, um, the, the format of the panel is that we're going to have uh, about 40 minutes of moderated discussion, then we're going to open it up for the floor. Uh, I plead to you, once you, if you get the chance to ask a question, make it very brief and to the point and make it a question, not a comment, so, so we can take as many as possible. So thank you very much. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining our conference. My name is Khaled Al-Abadi, and I'm a member of the Harvard Arab Alumni Association and a graduate of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm an education researcher and also an advisor for Yemen's mission in the United Nations. And in those capacities, I have witnessed firsthand the tremendous um, uh, damage and catastrophe that both Syria and Yemen's conflict have created in the region. Um, both those conflicts are seemingly intractable. They have taken political, ethnic, sectarian, and even nationalist dimensions. What will it take to end these conflicts? What can be done to rebuild these societies? What role do old and new regional institutions have in helping both Yemen and Syria transition into peacetime and post-conflict recovery? To help us answer these questions, we have organized an esteemed panel of regional dignitaries and experts. We have invited a number of um, high-level panelists, which I'll let our moderator introduce. And they are here to answer some of these most intractable questions and help us come up with innovative policies for the future. Allow me first to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sultan Barakat, who is currently our Director of Research at the Brookings Institute in Doha. He has over 25 years ex of experience working on conflict mediation and transition to peacetime and recovery. In 1993, he founded the Post-War Reconstruction and Development Unit in the, at the University of York, and this remains today a leading center in conflict research. Dr. Barakat is the ideal person to help us navigate this complex discussion on conflict resolution and post-conflict recovery. He will now introduce our panelists and he will explain the structure of this discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Barakat and our esteemed panelists. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Khalid. It's a great honor to be, um, to be here today, and uh, in particular to be asked to moderate such a distinguished uh, panel. I have been working for almost 25 years in the area of conflict and reconstruction, and much of my work has been in the Middle East. But to be honest, it's never been proper reconstruction. And the words of His Excellency earlier this morning echoed very, very well with my experience from Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. And it is really the reason why I believe this kind of gathering is very, very important, is to start to think for ourselves, how are we going to innovate from within the region to come up with political solutions to our endless conflict and to engage in the reconstruction of our nations, not just physically, but politically, socially, economically, and, and so on. The MENA region is, is, uh, has become known for, for the spread of conflict, and unfortunately since 1945, or since the uh, wave of uh, independence, almost 90% of the states within the MENA region have been involved in some kind of conflict, either uh, interstate conflict or internal conflict. And this is a rather high percentage when you take the average world is about 60%. But in the recent years, and in particular since 2011, we've seen a particular expansion in the scale and the geographical coverage of conflict around our region. And we have seen an incredible increase in the number of displaced people across our region uh, as a result of intractable conflicts. We will today focus on, on two of those conflicts in Syria and Yemen. And we will have to talk about the Cold War, if you like, that is going on between Yemen and some Arab, uh, between Iran and some Arab nations that has a link to these two conflicts. That, of course, is not to say that other conflicts are not as important or as critical in holding the region back, uh, particularly the conflict between Palestine and Israel uh, and other conflicts that are going on at the moment in, in Libya, Iraq, and elsewhere. 
but it is, uh, we have a limited amount of time and we have had to, to decide on, on, on what to focus on as an entry to a broader discussion around conflict in our region. To help us explore the subject, uh, the format for today is that I will in a minute introduce our panelists and then I'll be addressing one question to each of them and giving them the opportunity to respond for about three to five minutes and then we will start our conversation from there. I hope that we'll be able to reserve the last uh, 30 minutes at least from our session that's around 11 11.30, 11.40 uh, for uh, discussion with the audience. Uh, but I would ask you kindly to make sure that you only ask questions and avoid making uh, long uh, statements so that we can make best use of the knowledge and expertise of our uh, panelists. Uh, let me start by introducing our uh, uh, Mr. Hadi Al-Bahra, sitting on the far left. Uh, Mr. Al-Bahra is a member of the Syrian opposition movement. He joined the opposition movement in May 2013 and became the president of the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces from 9th of July 2014 until January 2015. He was elected to be the general secretary of the political committee within the opposition movement and was chosen to be the chief negotiator uh, of its delegation to the Geneva II Conference uh, on Syria. Uh, Al-Bahra holds a BSc in Industrial Engineering and uh, he has uh, engaged in, in uh, business and industrial work before uh, choosing politics uh, more recently. Next to Mr. Al-Bahra, we have His Excellency Mr. Haider Abu Bakr al-Attas, who is the former Prime Minister of Yemen, uh, and he served as a Prime Minister immediately following the unification of Yemen in 1990 until 1994. Mr. al-Attas, uh, before uh, the unification, uh, was also the Prime Minister and Chairman uh, of the Supreme People's Council in the former South Yemen, and held many ministerial uh, positions uh, from starting from 1969 uh, onwards. Today he is uh, an advisor to the uh, Yemeni president, uh, Mr. Hadi. And of course, our third panelist does not need uh, much of an introduction. Uh, we're all familiar with him. His Excellency Yusuf Ben Alawi Ben Abdullah is the minister responsible for foreign affairs in Sultanate Oman and he's been holding this post since 1997. Uh, uh, but he's known to all of us for having forged a particular uh, for, uh, school of foreign policy in the Arab world, and I'm really eager to learn more from him as to how that has been possible for, for Oman, and what are the challenges in particular Oman faces as a result of taking the middle ground in, in many of those uh, issues and conflicts that, that we, we face today. So with that, I'll, I'll start the discussion, please, with Mr. Uh, um, sorry, with Mr. Hadi. If you could uh, start us with on the conflict in Syria. Uh, we live a moment now where uh, the prospects for the future are probably uh, better than ever before. Uh, at least the parties are talking to each other directly. Uh, there are some propositions being put forward from various sides. Uh, could you just take us into the uh, immediate uh, future as you see it? Is there a possibility for uh, a solution in, in Syria today? And what would be, what is required in terms of innovation and foreign policy to, to reach that point? Uh, it's not working. Okay, uh, first I'm honored to be among you. Uh, I would like to share a little bit about the root cause of what's happening in the most of the Arab countries, and especially in Syria. 
it's somehow it's related to innovation. To innovate, to create, it requires to be able to dream. In 2004, I did the project in Syria, and it was the first edutainment exhibit in Syria, where it was attended by more than 100,000 audience. At that time, I hired university students to act as tour guides to explain to the visitors. I had one question in common, which I asked all of them. What do you want to do after graduation? I was amazed, shocked, that all of them answered one, one answer. After graduation, we need to find a relative or a friend who knows someone in the government and I get employed by the government. None of them had a dream about establishing his own business. None of them has a dream to become a member of the parliament or a minister or a president of the country. At that time, I knew that the regime in Syria had stolen the most precious thing from all the young generation. They stole their ability to dream. And if you cannot dream, you cannot innovate, you cannot create, you cannot advance. At that moment, in 2004, I knew that a revolution will come in Syria. It's about the future of the generations to come, about the future of our country. And this problem is common among majority of Arab countries. There is a chance for Syria, and this chance, if it could be captured, recognized, and to be honest, by the main superpower brokers, which are Russia and the US, for a path to rebuilding uh, the peace in Syria, is reestablish the peace, and for a political resolution of the crisis. Currently, we are following this actively in Geneva through the Geneva talks, but until now, we find no other partner on the other side of the table. They are trying to not really uh, answer the critical questions. They are not in the position really to be responsible until now. They keep running away and try avoid to uh, address the critical issues. But I think with our resolve, with the help of the international community, there is a real chance and the window of opportunity maybe for six months, if we capture it right, maybe we have a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Can I ask you please just to clarify what are those critical issues that you think the regime is, is not responding to? Mainly creating the basic steps about discussing the political transition itself. The whole process of the crisis in Syria, it's built into achieving a political transition, organized political transition, where you can empower the Syrian people at the end to be able to rewrite their constitutions and to be able to elect their leadership freely and uh, in a fair way. So the regime until now trying to avoid talking core issues within the political transition like rewriting the constitution, re-electing the people representative, and the steps for establishing a new government through uh, new elections or other process. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll move on to, to Yemen. We'll come back to, to the, in the question session to Syria in a minute. But uh, His Excellency Haider al um, again, we are uh, this month marking another anniversary. I mean, it's already five years this month since the Syria crisis started with the, with the Dara uh, clashes. And uh, it's a year since the bombing campaign started uh, in, in Yemen. 
uh, where do we go from here? What are the options uh, ahead of us? There doesn't seem to be clear policy being put forward to ending this particular conflict. Thank you very much. And I'm very much glad to participate in this session and this meeting, which was arranged by Harvard Alumni Association. The question of Yemen is complicated and not complicated. It is complicated if we don't want to look at the roots of the problem. And it is not complicated because it is clear what is the, what is the problem in Yemen. I am from south. Some people, when I speak, they say the southern have this idea. It's not that. The root of the problem was the wrong unity made or announced between the two states in Yemen, south and north, in May 1990. The unity was done between two different mentalities. The unity was held without proper preparation. So the problem was emerged immediately after the first two months of the unity. And there was, it was clear that there's something wrong. The mentality in the South was mentality of the tribe and the military. And they want to dominate everything. The mentality of the South there is a civil state in the South. Because the British administration was there for a long time, it laid down the roots of a civil state. The tribe has no rule in the South, but in the North, the tribe was very strong. And there is collision between the tribes and the military people in the North. So when we tried to, to stop and say, what is the problem? Because nothing was done. Nothing cannot be moved. And our brothers from the North want to dominate everything. After two months, nearly, or three months, four, the war broke in Iraq, and Iraq invaded Kuwait. And there is, there is a new question emerged. What's that? And we found that there is a relation, there is a link between Saddam Hussein and Ali Abdullah Saleh. Anyhow, we tried to put the first, the first trial to solve the problem of the unity and to, to make state. And we made a program, a reform program. Has been, after a long discussion, has been ratified between, by the parliament in 15 December 91. See here, in the second, in the first year of the unity, in the first year of the unity, and the program was focusing to build the state, to build the state, and try to gradually to take in the tribe into the state, and to make, to, 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 the military should take its proper role, not to enter in all different role in the civil life of the people. Immediately, when we started to, to uh, implement this, they started to oppose. We tried to push, and then they opposed, and then they started a plan or a campaign of assassination, all the cadres coming from the south. And 150 person cadres, leaders, military and civil has been assassinated in Sana'a in 1992. The main, then the problem grows up. We went to a dialogue 
between the two, between the political factions. And then we came to an agreement called the Blade and Accord Agreement. We signed in Gordon in April 94. This again focused to build the state in a better progress. This means that to make the unity, to, to make the different parts of the country to take their, uh, their rule by themselves. Decentralization. After we signed this, we tried to implement the tribes and the military of Sana'a broke a war against the South. And that war was very severe war. And they tried it and they succeeded to invade all the South and to put the South under power by military. And, and after that, instead of trying to, to solve the problem and keep the South within the unity, they tried to deal with the South as a, as a farm to, to take everything from it, to take everything from it. And imagine that. The airport in Sana'a, up to now, it's a, it has been changed as a property of Saad bin Hussein Lahmar, the Sheikh of Hash. Because during the war, he came and camped there. So they failed to solve the problem of the South. Then the Southern people came out in the street under the name of Al Harak, the peaceful Harak Selmi. Maybe no one said that very much. It, the people in South, nearly the majority, they said, we don't want the unity anymore. Then the opposition in the South, in the North, came, put this question about within the, the uh, Southern people. And we had a number of meetings in different places that you are going to, uh, split to go out because Ali Abdullah Saleh is, does not want to, to solve the problem. They said, let us work together and drop Ali Abdullah Saleh from the unity, from the power. But we found that they are sharing different views, some with Ali Abdullah Saleh and some with us. Anyhow, after the, 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 uh, the, the uh, the Harak and Ali Abdullah Saleh thought that Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, as they helped South in 1994, will help South to, to assassinate, to, to separate, or to divorce the unity. And then he tried to enter into the wars with in Saada in Saada to make a problem in the borders of Saudi Arabia. And by that, he strengthened the Al-Houthi and he made the Al-Houthi as a big power trying to threaten the Saudi Arabia with them. And then the spring Arabs came in Cairo and Libya and the youth in the north started their uh, started their revolution and then the revolution grows in the north very quickly very quickly and then the the regime and Sana has split Ali Abdullah Saleh and Ali Mehsan the two main figures and Sheikh Abdullah Ali Mehsan and Sheikh Abdullah took out of the uh, regime, and then they came with the revolution. And then there was a conflict between them, uh, armed conflict in Sana'a. Then the Arab states entered with their initiative, they called Initiative 
from the Gulf, Gulf Initiative. And then according to that initiative, a conference was held in Sana'a. The conference all agreed that the main reason of the problem was the southern problem. Everybody. And they agreed in the, in the conference that the main problem need to be discussed and solved it is the southern problem, is the problem of unity between north and south. In spite of that, in spite they confessed that this is the main problem, but they tried to touch it on the, on the borders, little. But at last, finally, they came with a solution which will lay the first step towards solving this problem of the south and the other problems. When the conference, when the conference ended, and they will start to implement this, Ali Abdullah Saleh doesn't want that to be done because they are against to uh, solve the problem of unity by agreeing to make a federal state, a new state, not a centralized state. And this is the issue we started after the unity. And then he decided to stop implementing the uh, outcome of the conference. Yes. So he, this time, just, uh, in, in, uh, and, uh, he brought Al Houthi again, and he helped Al Houthi, and they tried to uh, topple out the uh, government and the state. Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi, the president. The mistake Al Houthi made that they enter Sana'a by force, and they started to open to all the people that relation with Iran. And Iran started to help them with weapons and other things. And, uh, the other mistake they made after Sana'a, they dominated Sana'a, they go towards the south. And when they go towards the south, that means they want to dominate all the Yemen, then the Ar Arab uh, Gulf state in, uh, entered and started the, uh, the war bombing the, uh, the, the uh, military of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh and Al Houthi. I think now everybody wants to come to a solution. There are some perspectives that people now started to see that the real problem we are escaping from it, we have to solve it. And I hope that in the coming future, the, the people will come together and start to discuss the different issues of the problem in, in Yemen and come to uh, a solution that will solve the problem in two aspects, the problem in Yemen itself and the relation with the uh, Gulf states, especially with Saudi Arabia, because the problem in the north is a historical problem between uh, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for explaining the historical link to the uh, issue of southern Yemen. I think it's, it's an important issue, which is often not considered when talking about the current affairs in, in Yemen. Uh, Your Excellency um, uh, Yusuf uh, Ben Abdullah, um, we, we live in a region where we seem to have lost the art of conversation. We are no longer allowing space for each other to talk, uh, to resolve the, the many conflicts with their complexity that we have just heard. Uh, a lot of the issues here are being based on exclusion of, of the other. Uh, we seem to always see ourselves as the victims of interventions from outside, whether regionally or internationally. Uh, we somehow uh, often get the sequencing of events wrong. We talk about rushed unification. Uh, we push for writing a constitution maybe a bit too early. Uh, we push sometimes for elections at the time when we know that you cannot access your population to participate in those elections and so on. So there, there seems to be a real gap in terms of uh, thinking 
uh, regionally, how, how do we and where do we start addressing our own problems? And uh, I'm uh, aware of, of Oman in particular and its attempts to open the door for dialogue on a number of issues. And we'd really appreciate if you could just take us uh, through your, your own vision for um, what can be done into the future. Can, uh, the regional or organizations that we have are not effective. Uh, is there an alternative? Can we innovate in ways of resolving conflict regionally? Thank you for this very important questions and very large uh, space of and, and, and length, which we cannot do it in just to this very limited time for it. But I think, uh, I think uh, strongly that uh, main of the problem, there are so many problems, so many reasons for it. But one of the main reasons is the administrations. Many government uh, are not able to function in a proper administration to make their, their power and their authority are uh, uh, capable enough to attend any difficulties happens at the time. They just leave it growing and not attend it. There are no space for uh, uh, negotiations, no space for uh, you know, considering that sometimes people make uh, mistakes. Uh, in our you know, you know, discussions in the Arab League, it's uh, hardly you see one admit that he might made a mistake. And, and every time, everyone would see that his position is the right position, need to be supported by the rest of the people. And it's very, very bro bro problematic is if you said, no, this is not the right thing. You made a mistake. You should first come to this group of Arab state, consult with them on the issue, on the matter, which you want to act. So then you will get advice from your brothers on the best way, how do you make that actions? This is one very typical uh, problem. Second, the Arab League, if you, were, if you are making reference to Arab League, and not functioning, yes, it's not functioning as it should be. But Arab League was built in the, in the 40s uh, and become active in the early 50s for one cause. And that is the Palestinian cause. The seven countries who were having their sovereign independence met together with the British uh, assistant, creating Arab League. Now we are 22 countries, unable to function in, as, as, one, uh, as one group. Uh, uh, and I think one of the things is that we talk a lot about uh, joint Arab cooperation and Arab actions. But with no really seriousness. And that is because every country, it develops its own country separately. There is no common program where they can work together to lift up the country who's remain behind. One of them, as His Excellency was saying, Yemen. It was suggested at one time that the Arab League should put some sort of a similar system, economic system, such as is being now adopted and become very powerful proposals in the European unions. Uh, some of us have suggested that we should uh, uh, legalize uh, a percentage of 1% on the custom duty uh, to be used for the Arab, for the Arab cooperation uh, actions uh, in the future. That was, the, that was really was suggested because if that was happened, Arab League might really, you know, get out of that something around $600 million. Now, the budget of the Arab League, who should be developed and, uh, and built a great nations, 
their budget is 60, 000, 60 million dollars. Out of 22 countries, 60 million dollars. And not all, all of them is paid in time. So you should, you should accept that uh, a, a, a system, a political system like this, cannot be survived. There is also another dimension. All the countries who independent gain in the 60s or in the 50s, when their population was very, very reasonable, between maximum 20 million people to say 1 million people or 200,000 people, maintain the same administration system up to now. Whereas those who were 20, now are 90 million. How come this system can afford or be capable to meet the demands of 90 million people where it was designed only for 20, 20 million? So we have a very deep uh, problems in the Arab world. There's a big roots into the past, which is now it should be reformed. We have talked about the reforms, but reforms not on the basis of economic reforms, of cooperation and economic reforms. It is on basis of uh, solidarity. We, uh, we think we can act as the European Union, where we have so many institutions, but no finance. Or even like the uh, African uh, uh, unity, where they have a peaceful force, but with no finance. So you can imagine how difficult is the life of the Arab nations. But there are attempts now to find ways out of these problems. And I think the future of the Arab world should be totally developed in a different approach. Uh, Arab League still remains the, the umbrella for the Arab countries. It should be remain, but it should be enhanced. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the focus on, on the state is, is very important because in, in many ways we got it so often wrong and repeatedly wrong in uh, constituting effective states and also in constituting uh, an accountable relationship between state and citizens. Uh, and that has led to a lot of the problems as, as you've uh, highlighted earlier. But what I also think is very interesting from uh, Your Excellency's presentation is the link between that and the regional responsibility. It is about time that we think regionally and not just nationally. And with this, I'd like to go back to Mr. Hadi. As, uh, the, as a leader in the Syrian opposition, what is it that you're putting forward in terms of potential form of, of, uh, of state for Syria that maybe account for these two issues? the effectiveness of the state and the accountability to the citizens and maybe its uh, uh, regional relationships? I think the most important first when we look at the issues in regional terms and it has to be looked at also where it fit within the international community in total. Uh, what we really we are suffering is the lack of vision. There is no clear vision for the Arab world where they want to be in the future, what role they want to play. Same for many countries in the region. Few countries in the region, they have a national vision, a clear plans where they want to be 10 years or 20 years from now. I think the cornerstone for building mutual understanding and establishing peace and security in the region is defining the whole area. This is the first step. After we define the vision, we have, as Arab, to see how we get there. What is our strategy to reach that and achieve that uh, vision? And to do it properly, I think we need really 
to see our past in proper way, to admit our mistakes, as His Excellency in his uh, opening speech, he really touched a basic element that for us as Arab, we, we are being taught our history from elementary school to secondary school with all victories and all positive ideas with no concentration whatsoever about all the mishaps and the negative parts of our history. We need to look at our history objectively. We need to be critique our performance objectively to define our mishaps, our faults, and see how we can correct them and uh, fix them. After doing that, we can define our vision, define our strategy, how to get there. For Syria, we want it to be a part of a prosperous Middle East, a democratic Middle East where all people really uh, looking, look forward to achieving a mutual uh, plan for the whole region to achieve peace, prosperity, and most importantly, to build a future for the young generation. As we know, all the Arab world, the young generation is more than 40% uh, to 60% in many countries. So job creation is a major part. And in order to build this system, issue and this is as you mentioned is the critical part because with the proper accountability whatever political system you have in any of the countries in the Middle East if, if there is a proper then we can really achieve uh, an acceptable governing system we need to make a room The economy, it's okay, to lead the economy into prosperity, to offer them political leadership and role to play within the area. No problem. This one, okay. <clears throat> Syria has to be democratic, multi-party system, uh, prosperous, no discrimination whatsoever under any of its citizens and among them for uh, ethnicity or for religious or for any type of uh, discrimination. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, youth and uh, job generation, is, it's a huge issue for us. The youth, youth bulge in the region is, is great. Unemployment uh, is, is growing. And His Excellency uh, touched upon uh, uh, the discussions around Yemen as one example, that excluding Yemen from the prosperity of the Gulf has really trapped millions of people in poverty and will continue to generate its problems. And uh, we don't seem to see uh, other uh, Gulf countries see this as their national security, that we have to do something about the many unemployed in Yemen. Uh, particularly when you compare to, to the uh, market, labor market in, in the Gulf. You know, we, you're importing millions of, of people from, uh, the, uh, from India, South A East Asia, and elsewhere. And we have uh, millions of unemployed uh, young Arabs in, in, in Yemen and elsewhere. At the same time, we are all developing strategies for food security but without necessarily relating to countries where food can be produced uh, across the region. And overall as a region, um, my understanding is probably it has the lowest rate of inter-regional trade between it and by, by far the lowest rate of people's mobility. You can't just move freely across the region. Uh, those are some of the bigger picture issues. And I don't know to what extent in your discussions around the future of Yemen, you engage on those issues, or are you just focused on trying to reach an end to this particular conflict in the hope that there will be a time later to consider those longer term issues? 
Well, I think the first issue is to, to, to stop the war and then to discuss all the matters. But uh, I think uh, what uh, His Excellency put that the, the, the main problem li lies under the misadministration. That's correct. That's correct. When the unity made between it, there was a perspective, it succeeded. After that, it was there. Is. But the misadministration of the governments leads to all these things. And the mis comes from that everybody wants to dominate. There's no democracy. And we are looking for that. Uh, Yemen is not a poor country. But there is a poor administration in Yemen. Yemen can be supportive to its friends in the Gulf. But again, the, 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 the problem in Yemen is rooted and is not solved from long time. When I speak in Yemen, especially in the north, the main, the main problem which faces the civil state in Yemen and the proper administration is the tribe and the arms. This is rooted in the north. Rooted in the north. This also rooted with another problem that during the imam problem that I'm sorry to say that the Zaidia wants to dominate power because imam was Zaidi and Zaidia was only 20% of the population. So he governed the whole Yemen before the unity. The Ta'iz and al hudaida are Shafi'i, not Zaidi, but they dominated. And the tribes which have the power are from this sector. Uh, when the unity came, the problem became bigger. Bigger, because we didn't, we thought that this problem has been uh, solved after the imam is uh, finished in 1962. But the problem was rooted there. Was rooted, it is not solved. These three issues in the north was not solved. The tribes, the, the armies, and the, uh, uh, this, uh, what the domination, want to dominate. So there's no administration can be succeeded in Yemen and, uh, if it is continued to be like this, united, and then we have to solve the problem, dismantle it. We have to go back to the two states. There is a lot of uh, chances that the civil state will come back very quickly in the south because it was there already before unity. Only Ali Abdullah Saleh tried to corrupt it, tried to corrupt it and called back the tribe problem and the revenge problem and this problem in the, in the south which make the people always fighting each other and, and then we have to find a way to help the north to, to, to solve these two issues so that it can come in the civil state. The, uh, the, the, the Gulf state has a responsibility towards the, uh, the, the Yemen. Yes, there is a density of people in Yemen and uh, still the, the perspective of Yemen was not exploited yet, so they need to give a chance for them for labor in different countries of the Gulf so that they can help the people to solve. And this also will help uh, overcoming this problem, the tribe problem. And, uh, if many tribes people go outside, outside Yemen, they leave the weapons and they leave this problem. So they become with this civil state in the countries, they go. Some of them, they went to America, some of the state, some of the Gulf. Uh, Gulf. So the more we assist uh, Yemen to solve these problems, the more we can speak about the proper civil, we can speak, uh, we want a civil state, we want democracy, we want everything. And then when you go from the table, people immediately uh, start practicing 
their uh, their uh, their habits. So uh, that is uh, why we can in, in in Yemen we need to touch the problems as they are not only in Yemen to convince our mistakes that we made in in the past, as brother said also, and uh, and then uh, we can come to a way and to solve the problem in which people will live in peace and civil by convincing each other. If I don't accept you, I cannot live with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if you allow me, Your Excellency, uh, the elephant in the room really is, is sectarian division and the sectarian language that we have become so accustomed uh, using in the last few years. We uh, comfortably refer to Shia, Sunni, Zaidi, Shafi'i, ila akhro, which we weren't doing maybe six, seven years ago. What is it that went wrong in our uh, political vocabulary? And to what extent do you think Iran is at the root of this? I mean, we all, the two conflicts in Syria and, and Yemen uh, cannot really be um, disassociated at least in terms of their causation and in the justification for, for uh, uh, maintaining them from, from the Iranian influence. I think this is something which is a phenomena which has happened in the last few, few, few years. But it has uh, political ambitions. Uh, uh, that is, was introduced uh, uh, to the Arab world, uh, the political Islam. Political Islam is not limited to one sectarian. Uh, political Islam uh, covered all type of sectarians uh, in, the, in the Muslim countries, not only in Arab countries, but in all in the Muslim countries. Uh, so we are living this uh, phenomena which is, has caused a lot of uh, distractions uh, and it has uh, also demolished the very started uh, 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 culture of liberalism in, in the Arab world. Uh, we have, the Arab world has gone through uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, transactions. Uh, uh, we started in the 50s with the Arab, Arab and Arabism. And then uh, that was, uh, uh, of course, made away because of the Israelis' war against Egypt and Syria and the rest of the Arab world of the 60s war, which is, has created a lot of uh, setback in the Arab world. And then uh, a lot of uh, political organization or political mindset has uh, left that uh, Arabism and gone to leftism or communism at that times, and that has had taken us for a period of time. Now we are living uh, political Islam. Uh, political Islam tools are secret sectarians. Iran is a Shia state. Uh, the rest of the Arab world uh, mostly are uh, Sunni state, but this is, is something which is, was not there. It's not in the history of Islam. During the Khalifate of uh, Amawiyin and uh, um, Khalifate of Abbasiyin, this was not there. Uh, all these sectarians is a s school of thought. Has nothing to do to do with the. Between, uh, to do with the public, with the, with the majority or the mass of the, of the of Muslim people. It is for those scholars between themselves. But now it become important for the politician leaders. Uh, and I feel this is, is uh, waves it's going to fade away also. It's not going to continue. We have seen now after five years of uh, fighting their own political Islam fighting their own way uh, in many of the Arab countries. Now they are coming to uh, compromises with the rest of the community in their own countries. Uh, <clears throat> and I think the sectarians 
religious sectarians will also go away. What we hope is to see liberalism prevail. Where I had in my introduction statement, we need to have that type of culture to, uh, to be a partner with the international community, uh, stockholder of technology, where we can uh, get our share of life in the coming future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My last question, and then we will turn to the audience. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for, for uh, further questions is to do with, with building capacity. Now we're hosted by this distinguished academic group. Um, what is it that you're preparing both in Yemen and in Syria in terms of capacity to address issues of conflict and in particular humanitarian developmental issues? We are now having to deal with millions of displaced people. You're having to deal with, handle billions of dollars being at least promised uh, some of it is, is already coming into the country in terms of humanitarian assistance. Who's doing all this from within? And what are you as opposition and, and uh, uh, political leaders planning to do in the immediate uh, future? I think uh, thinking about Syria and the future, and mainly after establishing security and peace back, we have to think about uh, reconstruction, uh, reconstruction of Syria, and how to do it in proper way, and to utilize, you know, these crises and these horrible events which happened to make something good of the new Syria. How to build it in proper way how to really to concentrate on its potential and mainly human resources. As you know, Syria is a young uh, nation. Uh, we have 60% of the people who are less than 25 years old. Uh, we have high education rate in Syria, but the damage uh, being done to the country is tremendous. It's more uh, than $200 billion. So far, some people say it's almost $300 billion. It will take 15 years at least to go back to the economic uh, indicators of the 2007 if peace achieved tomorrow. So <clears throat> we as opposition, we have done a lot, participated in the reconstruction plan of Syria. Uh, on all sectors, economical, social, and education system, and so far. But also we have tremendous responsibility on handling the humanitarian crisis which is happening right now. <coughs> Syria is the biggest humanitarian misery it happened since a century ago. Uh, the highest number of refugees and internally displaced people, more than 10 million people. Uh, you have 4 million people of them outside Syria who are registered officially as refugees and 2 more million people who are outside Syria but not registered as refugees. Uh, the needs are tremendous and cannot be met by even countries. Until now, the, all what's pledged for Syria, the committed uh, paid out of it less than 40%, which means each Syrian outside Syria living on 40% of his needs for the whole year. So this has uh, put a lot of pressure on handling the humanitarian crisis now, on the discrimination happening against refugees and internally placed people uh, dealing with this issue currently, and planning for the future, which comes as most important to make sure that Syria will never pass again with the same crisis in its near future or far future. Yes, uh, thank you. For me, I think uh, we have two uh, different issues. Uh, first one is to uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian assistance now to the people during the war, which is so complicated and still we are suffering of that very much. It doesn't reach the real people who need it and also the hospitalization 
to treat the people who injured or those who are killed, the families of those who are killed uh, during this uh, war. The main issue of reconstruction, they started a discussion about that with two views. People, they think that we want to build the buildings which have been destroyed. I think we need to build the building, but before that, to rebuild the people there, the mentality. There's aggressive people, youths, the youths now that are so much aggressive. They don't, some of them, they don't know about weapons. They don't take weapons before the war. But now they think they are men with a weapon. And they become very much aggressive. How do we can change these ideas of the people? We need to put a real, a real ways and plans for development, for development. And then this will be done uh, into the course of reconstruction and de development in the future. This discussion is taking uh, place now uh, during the, the, the uh, opposition and also with the, the uh, collegian because it is a main problem and if we did not, if the war stopped without a plan of reconstruction and rebuilding and, and there will be a big problem uh, in, 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 in the country. Thank you Thank so you. much. We, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. If you can, please make, keep your question brief as much as you can. My question is to you, Your Excellency, um, uh, Minister Yusuf. Um, Oman played such a fundamental uh, role in um, obviously leading the P5 plus one negotiations. And but for that role, uh, perhaps we could have gotten to a uh, global escalation of the situation. Um, with that in mind, and knowing, having those relationships with the U.S., the U.S. is now pivoting, as we know, to the East. And uh, not only that, the Atlantic article which came out uh, calling for or defining the Obama doctrine, not only is confirming that pivot towards the East, but it's also expressing a level of disdain um, uh, towards the region tribalism, free riders, and so on. Uh, what are your views about that? And uh, if there were three things you would do to reorient us in a US free Arab world, what would you do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take two more questions. Before you answer, Your Excellency, we'll take two more questions. Please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Saud Lamari. I am the uh, President of the Saudi Arabian Harvard Club. I want to uh, thank our Omani host, who not only made us uh, feel comfortable, but feel uh, right at home. I also want to thank the distinguished panel. And I have a comment, uh, Mr. Moderator, and, and a question, really. Uh, I heard a gloomy picture uh, about the uh, status quo of the Arab world, which is not unusual. Uh, we have made a choice to be innovative, to be inspirational, and I regret to say I didn't hear enough of that. Uh, I've heard description of the problems. Uh, again, we've heard it. And um, I didn't hear a main culprit in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, in the GCC in particular, until towards the end from His Excellency Yusuf bin Alawi bin Abdullah, and that is Iran. And let's not be shy about that, ladies and gentlemen. Before the Iranian revolution, the Arab world had issues. The main issue was the Arab-Israeli conflict. Iran came created militias, it came with a constitution that characterized it as a Shia state. It also took an undertaking to spread the revolution and has succeeded and we are sleeping. They created the so-called Hezbollah, they spread hate in Iraq, 
they uh, went to Bahrain, they created the Houthis, they're oppressing their can, own people. Sorry, can I interrupt? Can you just pose your question? I will, I will. I'm coming to that. I've, I've asked you for a moment. I traveled all the way from Saudi, so... And I'm a lawyer. I want to have my day in court. <laughs> so let's, let's not kid ourselves. We have, you know, I grew up in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. The kid who was next to me, I didn't know he's a Shia until two, three years ago. I didn't care, it didn't matter. So we have serious issue. Again, the Arabs in Iran are being oppressed. They cannot, not a single Sunni mosque in Tehran, et cetera, et cetera. Question to the distinguished panels, what are we going to do about that? Enough is enough. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Maha uh, Kadura from Harvard Kennedy School, Dean's Council. I just want to ask uh, Mr. Bahra, when the opposition started in uh, Syria, I think 1911, ISIS was not part of the opposition. How come now we, we see only opposition is ISIS? Was it at the beginning, you know, part of the opposition, which I doubt it. Just I want you to clarify this, because there are so many questions, really, we couldn't find a solution. How could started a great opposition for reform and ended up to be ISIS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we have three issues. The Obama doctrine and the way the United States seems to be shifting east and losing interest in our region and would they leave us alone and all that different discussion that's going on. Uh, and I think maybe Your Excellency would be the best to respond to that one. Yes, uh, thank you, of course. We have uh, seen, uh, read, and analyzed the, the, the Atlantic uh, magazine uh, interviews with President Obama. Uh, of course, we understand uh, that he has made some areas of uh, uh, related to the GCC countries, and that is, uh, in my view, in my personal view, he is addressing uh, no policy which is, is going to be changed uh, <coughs> uh, from uh, the existing relation between uh, GCC countries and, uh, and the United States. Uh, I did not feel that that doctrine has made any uh, uh, feeling or any uh, addressing any sort of that the United States is leaving. Uh, no, that's not. But I think United States, as a, as a, as a friend, uh, they are addressing our, uh, some of our weakness, which they want us to look at it and see how we can play a role with them in the international arena. So that is our analysis. Uh, I think, I hope this is, 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 is obvious, it's clear for me, yes. Uh, Iran, uh, our neighbors, I mean, the GCC country, not only the GCC, it's uh, from Shat al-Arab in Iraq down to uh, the, the, Romania, uh, the, the Roman Sea. Uh, that line of coast is Iranian coast vis-a-vis uh, -vis the GCC also coast. So we are neighbors. But also, uh, what is happening in Iran? Iran has gone through a period of revolution. Uh, and it's still going, the revolution going on. So this is the nature of revolutions. You should not accept it, but you should live with it. And that's what happens in, uh, in this case. And uh, it was happened also before, before the Iranian, before the Iranian uh, revolutions. I mean, we, those who are f of my age uh, uh, lived with the revolution in Egypt. We lived, we, we, if we look at the history and see what is the revolution means, wherever it has taken place, it's the same nature. We're not going to continue as, as, uh, as, as uh, permanent. Iran and the international community came to uh, that uh, agreement of the nuclear program of Iranians, and I think everyone is satisfied with the level of 
having uh, no nuclear zo zones in this, in this region. Uh, and uh, I can see that uh, the matter of Shia and Sunnis, this is something which is it's not by the will of anyone else. Uh, but this happens. Part of this dynamic changes uh, in, the, in the Muslim world. Introducing the uh, political Islams. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I think this is for the uh, academics to, you know, make a search on what is happening, why this is happening. Is it, uh, is it a, a phenomena of today or it has a roots to the, to the history? Uh, but this is, this is, I think, it's for now, in my, in my view, it is, it's normal. In, in, the, in the, this turmoil, this is, you know, advanced technology. This is of uh, democracy, which is, is given the right for every single person on this, in this region or the globe can express his views. It is necessary that the views should be controversial also, which is you don't like it, but there's other people like it. So we have to live with this uh, period of time. We're trying to, me, to, to make sure that the damages will be at the minimum, but the damage is going to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Ustaz Hadi, if you can please briefly respond to the issue of ISIS. Yeah. <clears throat> First, make no mistake, ISIS never was from the opposition. ISIS is a terrorist organization, extremist organization, which its roots goes to the early 2000s in Afghanistan, and then it went to Iraq and to Syria. The Syrian opposition in the early 2013 first quarter, we were the first uh, side who issued a clear statement and position toward ISIL when the whole West was silent about it. In early 2013, we fought the first battles against ISIL and we drove them out of Aleppo and of Idlib. But unfortunately, after we won these territories back, all the help was cut and assistance on the Syrian opposition and we were not able to carry on our fight. ISIL, as any other terrorist organization, for sure it's infiltrated by so many intelligence uh, agencies throughout the world and being taken advantage of. But for sure, we look at ISIL and Nusra as terrorist organizations. They have no place in Syria and they have to get out of Syria in order to establish peace. But they are, by the way, they are the you know, same uh, you know, one coin with two faces, the regime and these organizations. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, uh, I'll, I'll have to bring it to a conclusion. I thank very much our uh, panelists. It would be impossible to summarize uh, the very rich points made during this session, but uh, in the form of conclusion, if you allow me, I'll just highlight some of areas where I think uh, political innovation is possible and maybe areas where we need to look uh, forward. Uh, together collectively. The first one is the idea of uh, a regional vision uh, to try and work uh, collectively on creating a vision that is inclusive, uh, a, a vision based on the principle of solidarity and humanity of, uh, for a region that could uh, in, enjoy its resources and build prosperity but not be disconnected from the rest of the world and recognize that we are part of this, of this globe. The second issue is, is the need to try and address conflict as early as possible. Uh, His Excellency alluded to the fact that many of the conflicts we see today, and also when we heard Mr. Uh, Lattas, he took us back into the history and the roots of this particular conflict in Yemen. Uh, it could have been resolved then, and we need to do as early intervention as, 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 uh, as possible. And for that, I think we need to be, as a region, uh, equipped with the right capacity, uh, uh, individuals and organizations, institutions who are capable of addressing conflict and dealing with, with the humanitarian needs and people's expectations before they develop 
into uh, frustration and, and lead to violence. We've also heard about the need to activate and strengthen the Arab League, in, particularly in the area of conflict uh, management, addressing uh, issues of conflict. And there was an idea uh, maybe put forward as, as uh, been discussed many times before, the need to create some kind of financial independence uh, for that organization to be able to operate effectively. And uh, of course, the m most important area of innovation is in creating effective states. Uh, we probably have quite a high percentage of fragile states in the region, and they're getting worse and worse uh, every day. Some uh, hardly control their own territory. And uh, the idea of an effective state that builds on uh, accountability to, to citizens uh, was, was, was brought up uh, again. Uh, and finally, I think on the issue of Iran, uh, and this is something uh, His Excellency also touched upon uh, in his uh, last comment, uh, we keep saying Iran is a state in revolution. The reality is that we probably deal with two, potentially more than one state simultaneously. And the deep Iran that has created all these militias and so on thrives on being isolated. And it is the nature of the isolation that Iran has lived that has created that kind of reaction. And maybe as an Arab world, there's an opportunity there to innovate, to come up with ways in which we can open our doors for dialogue with a state in order to strengthen the elected state in Iran as opposed to the militia and the mukhabarat uh, apparatus and so on that are now running the show uh, uh, both internally and uh, externally. With this, I thank you all for uh, listening to us and I thank our uh, panelists for the wonderful experience. Uh, you have noticed that not all my questions were answered, but this is, I think, is, is, uh, is ex expected from such a season, seasoned and experienced uh, politicians. But thank you very much for your time. Uh, and as you said, I think uh, we'll get started. We'll try and uh, keep this as engaging and interactive as possible uh, and within a time frame to uh, allow you to go for lunch. Uh, and for Sham al -Wir, not to disrupt the proceedings there. Please, Sham. Thank you. <coughs> so if we can get started. If everybody can take their seats or if they're having conversations to continue them in the corridors there. Shaham, can you regulate your area over there? So we're going to be uh, seated. Some of us may stand during our presentations. Uh, but the plenary panel uh, uh, number two is <laughs> about the economy in the Arab world. And its title, as you can see from your program, Building an Innovation Economy uh, in the Arab World, and really building on essentially a second pillar, but related uh, to the first panel, which is about uh, the politics and policies and finding common ground, creating that ecosystem that really enables the economy. I just want to make one comment uh, just before delving into our uh, panel discussion. And that was an issue that was kind of, uh, you know, it was a soft issue that was there in the last panel, and it was about identity. And there was a mention about identity that a number of years ago, I didn't even know the identity of my neighbor. And we somehow think that it's, that is progress, if we can go back to that. And I would just put a thought out there for people to think about in the, through the course of the day, as you think about new ways of thinking, that pluralism, is not about the absence of identity, but the acknowledgement and coexistence of identity 
and that diversity is not a threat that needs to be hidden, but it is an, a fact in the Arab world and even the Muslim world that is a strength that can be embraced. And that's something I think we can think about through the course of the day and even on, on this panel. Um, so we have a great panel uh, with us. I want to introduce some of our speakers. We have uh, with us Deepa Khanna, who is the Chief Investment Officer uh, for the International Finance Corporation, or IFC, in the region. Um, he's taking the place of Muayyad Makhlouf, uh, who unfortunately had a family emergency uh, and had to stay behind in Beirut. Um, we were also due to have uh, Habib Haddad from WAMDA, uh, who has uh, a board emergency uh, in Beirut, and he couldn't fly here because there's only one flight a day, so I don't know, we have Oman airports, maybe we can uh, help with some of the flight times, but we'll, we'll get to that, uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but we're very pleased to have with us uh, Hayal Ghanem, who's the Innovation uh, Director at the Qatar Science and Technology Park, and an MIT graduate for the MIT uh, alumni uh, in the... Look at that, can we get a round of applause there? From this your corner, Haya, right there. Uh, and we have Ayman uh, Husni, who's uh, the CEO of the Oman Airports Management uh, Company. Really one of the strong stories here in Oman, and uh, we really look forward to your presentation uh, today. The topic of innovation is thrown around, you know, quite a bit. It uh, seems to be the ubiquitous buzzword in the Arab world. Uh, and the question, you know, comes to us: كيف نشجع كيف نزرع كيف نمكن البيئة الابتكار في العالم العربي؟ علنا الإمارات مثلاً في 2015 عام الابتكار. وفي هذه الأيام يبدو أن كل واحد وكل حكومة يشتغل للتطبيق الابتكار. ولكن شو يعني هذا الابتكار؟ ولكن في الواقع ماذا يعني هذا المفهوم؟ في الاقتصاد العربي والبلدان العربي. What we're hoping to get out of this panel today is coming down to the real meaning of this topic, to really think about what it means in practice. If we end this hour with just another hour of buzzwords, we're going to talk about how we're going to be number one in an index and look at this initiative we're doing. We failed. I think everybody here has been to an entrepreneurship conference, an innovation summit, and you get a chief innovation officer talking to you. There's a beautiful chart on the screen, and they inspire you, and nothing happens. So what we're going to press each of our panelists to do is really talk about practical examples where they're using, utilizing, and fostering innovation in their companies, in their organizations, in their countries, and the region. Now. Can you measure innovation? Uh, there is a global innovation index uh, of 140 countries. Saudi Arabia is the first ranking Arab country. Uh, Israel is 21, uh, or the Zionist entity, however you want to refer to it. Uh, Saudi is 43. The UAE is 47. Qatar is 50. And Oman is 69. But what is in a ranking? I'm not really sure what these rankings are ever measuring. But we're definitely seeing that GCC countries are ahead of the curve. And some of that has to be attributable to the wealth that exists here in terms of uh, the resources that this region has benefited from. But I often see some of these new hospitals that are built, very state-of-the-art hospitals in Qatar, in the UAE. But there's no medical schools. There's a very, very small medical research sector. So what are we talking about innovation and what are we talking about the sustainability of innovation and what we're bringing in terms of talent uh, and the next frontier of ideas? The reality is that in a majority of other countries in the, in the Arab world, and of course it was a sobering discussion that we just had, corruption, censorship, and conflict act as inhibitors for innovation. But we can also conversely think that in those challenging situations, we probably have some of the most enlightening and enlightened examples of innovators and innovation. 
I mean, we look at the stories in Syria and what people are doing on the front lines to respond to humanitarian situations. There is innovation there. So let's not forget about what's happening even in these, what we would say proverbially, dark corners of the region. There's actually a lot for us to learn from some of those examples also beyond where we are today. So let's have a real conversation. Um, and I want to first start off with uh, uh, my friend Deepak and to really turn to you to describe a little bit about how the IFC really thinks about innovation in the region and what are the kind of markers that you see that enable uh, growth, that enable uh, development, that enable innovative companies to succeed. And maybe you could give an example of one of the investments you've made um, kind of on this. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, and I'd like to thank the Harvard uh, Arab Alumni Club for uh, the kind invitation. Uh, just by way of background, uh, the IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Uh, in this region, we have about uh, $6 billion uh, invested in about uh, 250 companies, uh, all the way from Morocco through, through uh, Pakistan, and in addition, uh, we have uh, uh, financed about 20-odd uh, private equity and venture capital funds uh, to, to reach uh, the segments that we can't reach uh, cost-effectively. So, uh, you know, broadly speaking, the MENA region has been growing at about 5% uh, uh, per annum over the last few years. Uh, <coughs> this compares with 8%, 9%, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, China, India. Um, about uh, one out of every five people in this region is uh, living on less than two dollars a day. So there is some uh, degree of uh, <coughs> poverty. Uh, another uh, aspect is uh, the very high uh, youth uh, unemployment rates, uh, which are, uh, you know, in the, in the 25 odd uh, percent. So with, with the government uh, state-led uh, uh, economies, uh, which are coming under stress, uh, uh, it appears that uh, there is more uh, room uh, uh, and opportunity for, for uh, private players. And uh, we are uh, quite active uh, right now in, in Egypt, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Morocco, and elsewhere. And, and in terms of uh, innovative uh, companies, we've uh, recently invested in, uh, in, a, in a venture capital fund called uh, wamda.com, uh, where uh, Habib is not here. But, uh, but uh, uh, we've uh, provided about uh, $10 million to them. And they have in turn uh, invested in uh, newer uh, high-tech uh, kind of startups. Uh, there's uh, Jamalon, the Amazon-like uh, uh, bookstore. There's uh, Karabish, the online media company. Uh, later in the afternoon, uh, you'll be hearing from uh, one of the co-founders of Kareem, uh, the, the Uber of the region. So uh, we are trying in our own way to uh, get lower down to the bottom rung to support uh, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, we are also looking at uh, accelerators and incubators uh, and whatnot. So, so uh, going forward, I think uh, to um, foster this uh, kind of activity, uh, the two main focus areas, one is uh, education, and it was uh, mentioned earlier, and there is another panel, uh, how we are creating uh, the leaders of the future because uh, right now, despite uh, you know, considerable resources uh, going towards uh, education in these countries, uh, sometimes there is still a, a, a skills gap and, and a competency gap on what uh, private companies are looking for. And the second uh, broad area would be uh, legal and uh, regulatory <coughs> frameworks uh, to make it easier to do business in the region. Uh, Deepak, I mean, what are, when you look at some of these countries, Iraq and Egypt, I mean, what are the markers that you see uh, in the ecosystem where you say, wow, this country is really making an effort to enable innovation. Uh, what are the things that you see these countries doing? Um, I think uh, in, in the past few years, uh, uh, access to funding for growth companies has improved. I mean, there are uh, angel networks being developed, uh, uh, venture capital funds, and uh, even various uh, government-led uh, initiatives uh, in, in uh, research and, and uh, you know, the, the enabling uh, ecosystem to a degree. 
So, I mean, I'd love to turn to Haya. Uh, you know, you're uh, working in Qatar in a very interesting entity, the Qatar Science and Technology Park. You've also uh, sat on uh, the board and organizing committees for startup competitions. So you're kind of seeing the spectrum. How, how does a country, uh, from, from that macro standpoint, encourage innovation? How does an institution that's tasked with that objective uh, implement that? Thank you, Tawfiq. alaikum. My first task uh, after running business plan competitions and coming back to the region was to, to look into what we can do to have innovation-driven economy. It, it's part of the country's <coughs> development to look into diversification and being independent uh, of uh, uh, hydrocarbon resources. And the obvious answer is to look into what's missing in the country. And uh, a year ago, we decided to create an accelerator program in a nonprofit organization, uh, an NGO, uh, under uh, which Qatar Science and Technology Park comes uh, under it. But the accelerator program was not quite enough. It, it, it solves one aspect that's funding, mentoring, and, and um, creating an enabling environment for, for startups. However, understanding really what's missing required taking a completely um, data-driven approach and having a systematic approach and understanding <coughs> what is missing in the country. And we had to be very honest with ourselves if we wanted to get to that point of diversifying the economy. So we gathered data about what's missing, what are our strengths and weaknesses, and we looked into three main areas. What are the innovation capabilities in the country? Can we start and grow startups? What are the innovation <coughs> capabilities in the country? Can we create, generate new ideas and uh, drive them to maturity? And then what are the linkages between the innovation capabilities and the entrepreneurial capabilities. Do we have enough enabling programs to, um, to support this, uh, uh, this undertaking? And we, we come from a background of very early, uh, a, a very recent research. So in, since 2007, in 2007 there was no culture of research in the country, so we built this from from uh, from the beginning, and now we're trying to realize the uh, the outcomes of this research. So, we understood what is what is missing in in the three main areas: innovation, entrepreneurship, and linkages. And what we found out is that we're missing the <coughs> customer base, the customers who are willing to adopt innovation solutions in the country. The major purchasing power is in government right now, in the infrastructure, but is the government ready to adopt innovative, innovative solutions before we spin them off to become uh, global solutions? So we, uh, to address this concern, we built an innovation community that has major stakeholders <coughs> from government, risk capital, academia, entrepreneurs, as well as industry actors. And we've, we've been facilitating discussions among uh, all actors so that we make sure that an innovative solution that gets created in academia or in, um, in research institutes would have a chance in securing a local customer. And since we are a very small country with limited human resources, we decided to focus even in the vertical. And if this approach of an innovation community works, we want to replicate it in other verticals. Um, it happens that the thing people are most excited about right now is the mega event um, hosting in the country. So 
now we're trying to look into innovative solutions to have uh, to, ha to make it easier to have a large number of visitors coming in the country the customer experience from the from the day they land to the day they they leave uh, the country so we realized that yes we can do research we have the local capabilities we can st we can start and grow companies and what we need to focus on is special support for those innovation driven enterprises to start locally and um, have a global reach so I, I remember that my first meeting at Qatar Science and Technology Park USTP uh, was in 2010 I think maybe before you joined that I, I came it was January 2010 or December 2009 and uh, there was something there, Tidu Mane, I think, was, was, was heading it. And it was a very exciting story. I mean, when you went to Qatar and Science Technology Park, you went to this cavernous, beautiful building. You went around and we saw all the global companies. I mean, it was very innovative. Um, and now we're in 2016. And I guess my question to you would be, uh, you know, what, what has been the learning for Qatar Science Technology Park? Where was the vision in the beginning? And what were really some of the, let's not call them failures, but some of the challenges that you say, okay, wow, interesting, we can learn from that and do better. What were, what were those things that could be instructive for others who might be setting up a similar concept in their country? I think it's uh, no secret that there is low tolerance to failure in, uh, in the Arab world. What, what we went through in the Qatar Science and Technology Park is that we, we ha when we say we need to accept failure, we need to start from with ourselves. So we realized that it, we were successful in attracting a lot of corporate research in the country, but now what we really need is uh, the we need, the, we need the startups, we need the innovation-driven enterprises, <coughs> we need to support them. How can we use our previous focus on attracting corporate research to improve the environment for innovation-driven enterprises? And at that point, the shift in our strategy was seen as a failure when in in my opinion, without having corporate and industry partners, you can't really have a successful environment, an environment that, that can foster uh, startups. Uh, so I think the main, the main lesson learned is that we need to uh, realize where we stand and what, what, uh, what exactly the what, what we built so far and how we can take advantage of that moving forward. Great. Um, no, this is, is, is very interesting and that arc of learning, um, I think probably is not done enough of within institutions because there's an often a desire to say, look at how successful we are. And then between institutions, I mean, I wonder how many institutions that are of a similar nature across the different countries or actually talking to each other to see what they're doing. You know, we're coming <coughs> together in this conference, but I imagine uh, that this does not happen. Um, and it should, obviously, uh, and, and that's something to address. Well, we have with us, uh, Ayman, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, the Oman Airports Management Consultancy, they've just, uh, company, they've just done uh, an entire strategy process where they try to think through how does innovation and innovative practices embed within their company? Um, and so it's kind of a live case for us from here within Oman of what does this mean? Um, and so maybe I'll turn it over to you to kind of present that story, um, kind of building on these themes, uh, Ayman. Sure. And Ayman's gonna provide some physical movement to keep everybody awake here. And yes. Uh, well, actually, I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be here between you today. And uh, I thank Tawfiq <coughs> for giving the pleasure to uh, you know, be a bit of innovative and uh, giving me a chance to walk and uh, you know, 
because we have, uh, you know, this uh, panel is uh, about innovation. So he said, you know, we'll be innovative and, uh, you know, I'll let you walk. So thank you, uh, Toby. Uh, actually, uh, most of you are actually, uh, you know, flew uh, over to Masqat. And I hope that you enjoyed your, uh, you know, experience in the airport. When you travel back, for those who came from abroad, please uh, remember to, uh, you know, buy some gifts or, you know, anything from, from the duty free to raise our, uh, you know, salaries. So thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we actually, uh, you know, in uh, Oman Airports Management Company, we tried to, uh, you know, to be innovative. Uh, the government have, uh, you know, made uh, an investment of 1.2 billion uh, Oman Riyals to build five airports at once. This decision was made uh, five years ago. Uh, Salala Airport uh, just opened last year. Masqat Airport, inshallah, will open uh, in due course. And uh, Dukum and Sahar, uh, we have the runways and yet to have the buildings. Ras al Had on the way. Uh, the um, uh, agenda that I'll take you through is uh, 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 a company profile, the key facts and figures, what is needed to be done and strategy 2020 and the opportunities that we are actually floating to the market, whether it is the local or the international. Uh, <clears throat> this company is actually uh, running and operating the uh, airports on behalf of the government. We have a concession agreement with the government for 30 years to operate and manage and, and lease and, and uh, you know, sub uh, the, uh, the buildings, the, uh, you know, the uh, lands around the airports and, and make sure that we manage it, uh, you know, in a perfect way. Uh, five airports, as uh, I just mentioned, and uh, we're really, uh, you know, glad and uh, happy that we have those five airports at once. Uh, the government is uh, brave enough to make a decision and, and you know, to uh, enter to the aviation industry uh, from its wild uh, gates. Uh, if you see, the, uh, the world always runs into crisis. And if you, if you can see here, in uh, 1969 or 1973, we had the oil crisis. And then, because, you know, today we're in this mood, I just wanted to get this graph to you. Uh, <clears throat> according the, to the statistics, oil uh, crisis doesn't make any uh, uh, turbulence to uh, aviation industry. And as you see, the uh, industry is always growing, no matter what's uh, uh, happening in, in the globe. And uh, it looks like people are always on the travel. They're always on the run, which uh, is actually uh, doing good for, for us in the aviation industry. If you just uh, uh, concentrate and see uh, 2004 to 2014, those uh, 10 years, the growth is 85%. I think the technology is failing me, so I, yes. Uh, Masqat uh, growth is uh, up 18% from the previous year, and Salala is 22%. Uh, in the uh, uh, European uh, <coughs> arena uh, and America, the uh, growth is always one digit, whereas in Asia and Africa, it's, uh, thankfully, it's always two digits uh, so far. And uh, it's actually, you know, giving a lot of uh, weight to, uh, to the aviation industry. Uh, Suhar and Dukum uh, uh, is moving uh, ahead, and, and the uh, passenger capacity is growing. Uh, Ras Al Had is uh, an airport for uh, tourism and it will uh, open hopefully by the next uh, two years. We had actually uh, thought on how we can be different from others, how we can, you know, attract business, how we can uh, uh, make sure that we offer a different product than others. Because, you know, if you do the same thing, then you will not be different. So uh, we said we're going to actually concentrate on the human uh, 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 capital and we uh, made sure that you know we build the uh, uh, the knowledge of uh, the staff and we came up with uh, certain uh, ideas Thaber 
uh, for those who speak Arabic, I know, I'm sure that they know what's Taber. Taber means, you know, in, in, a, <clears throat> in a quick translation is like sweat, you know, work hard. Uh, this is um, uh, a package where you actually uh, apply for uh, masters and bachelors and you get a scholarship from the uh, company. The scholarship that you can uh, get is always uh, related to what the company needs and so on and so forth. Another uh, 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 package we did is Mu'tamid. Mu'tamid is a package that actually give you a, uh, a certified aviation uh, 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 certificate where actually, you know, gives you a better boost in the uh, company and the uh, aviation industry. Uh, <coughs> Assess is uh, uh, a course where you enter to the uh, uh, company for the first month and you get educated on aviation uh, you know, aspects and, and, uh, and uh, uh, aviation terminologies. Uh, Fikrati, this is a very nice one. This is actually open for, uh, and, and this is really an innovative uh, idea where one of the uh, staff have actually thought of it. And he, uh, he uh, 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 you know, uh, forwarded it to the management and the management took it over and, and, uh, and implemented it. Fikrati is, you give an idea. It doesn't matter whether the idea is right, you know, bright, good, you know, and, and the, uh, the management actually uh, goes and have like a committee and they choose the best idea and implement it in uh, the airport. We always like to uh, make sure that we push people, we push staff to, uh, you know, uh, be innovative, to think out of the box and to support them. I've been listening to the speakers uh, from morning till now, and um, you know, uh, we have a problem. I think uh, what Echi Yusuf uh, mentioned is that, uh, you know, sometimes you get an idea, and that idea doesn't get supported, unfortunately, and this is actually uh, 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 going even, uh, you know, uh, less nowadays, but we used to always criticize ourselves and we always not we don't like to uh, support uh, you know uh, new ideas whereas you know i think uh, from my point of view always you need to listen to your staff you need to listen to your partner you need to listen to your uh, you know neighbor you need to listen to your teacher you need to listen to your son and always support no matter what is the idea you need to support and what we did actually <coughs> we did the uh, a, uh, uh, since October we implemented, we actually, if you go and run and, and, and walk through the airport, you will see those ideas are actually implemented into the airport. And we always, you know, uh, make sure that we award the, uh, and appraise the person. Uh, employee of the month, uh, as you hear it, it's, it's actually a recognition for the staff. So we did all those, uh, you know, packages to make sure that we get innovation inside the organization. We're actually building a strategy, a five-year strategy, and we thought that, you know, you cannot go and get out of the shelf a, uh, a strategy and implement, or actually you get like a consultant, and you make this consultant, you know, write you something that you actually know. So we said we'll build the talent from within, and then we build uh, our uh, strategy ourselves. And actually, this room was one of the uh, uh, places that we uh, made our, you know, uh, thinkings and, and gatherings, and, and you'll, you'll see a picture. This is the last uh, point I'll talk about innovation is, you know, in the National Day, we always need to make sure that people enjoy their, uh, their work and, and, and they appreciate the organization they're working in. So uh, we, we do like a competition between the staff, and whoever decorates his department, we get him, uh, you know, a, an award, and, and we celebrate with him. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, this uh, 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 idea is actually, it's called swap job. One day I was a fireman, if you see, and one person was the CEO. And I made a deal with him that he doesn't fire me that day. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, it, wor it, it worked very good. And actually, uh, you know, it makes you appreciate what others are doing. So, you know, when, when I became a fireman, I, I felt like, you know, this is really good. And uh, I know now how much suffering they're getting to and what is actually missing in their work and what should be done. 
So, so actually, you know, this is just one example. You will, you will see lots of examples in that day, and, and people appreciated others. They didn't say that, you know, what is legal doing? Or what is finance doing? And why is this being done this way? So they lived the whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, journey, and, and, and they started appreciating each other. Our strategy, if you see, the middle picture is the same carpet here. So uh, we were sitting here one day. It was in uh, 21st uh, of December. And uh, we made sure that we involve all the staff. So uh, we did some brainstorming. We did lots of ideas. And uh, we wanted to involve everyone in the uh, organization to build our strategy. Uh, what we came up with, I know this is a bit hard. And people will think, you know, uh, what rank you are in. I will answer you. Uh, last year we were 77. This year we're uh, 96 in the world. And we want to become 20. So how can we do it? I think if we have a path, we have a roadmap, we have a vision, and we have a target, we can reach it. And I'll tell you, this is not impossible. This is very easy because actually the government have paid 1.2 billion worth of assets. So if we cannot be there, then all of this investment is just, you know, Useless. So it is hard, but it is not impossible. Our mission is together to excellently manage and develop the gateways of Oman. If uh, people who live in Oman and uh, they are like uh, not uh, born in 1980, they will know this. This is the runway strip in Matrah, and uh, this is how airports looks like. You just need a runway strip, you land the aircraft, you go home. <clears throat> Nowadays, it's a bit different. An airport is like a shopping mall, especially when you depart, because you know you sit there for an hour, and you need to make sure that you enjoy your stay, and you need to be connected, you need to have internet, you need to have a coffee, and you know. So uh, we, we moved from a landing space to an airport operator, and then a land road, and uh, this picture is Masqat Airport. I know most of you, especially Omanis, are asking, when do we open uh, Masqat Airport? But I'm not going to say it, because uh, Ministry of Transport are the ones who actually announce, not us. From uh, becoming an al a landlord to an airport city and a market player, we have actually pieces of lands in, uh, around the airport, and we would like to develop, and we're actually going to uh, uh, float tenders uh, on... Uh, on this, um, this month on, on uh, developing four-star hotels, whether in Masqat Airport and Salala. One of the audience, I think I met with him outside, and uh, he's an investor, and he was uh, looking forward to see this. Uh, uh, Arfi, I don't know, I think he left. <laughs> oh, you're here, yeah. Uh, so, so from going, I mean, I mean, this is part of innovation. You know, if you don't have innovation, you cannot go towards those you know, uh, 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 stories. And actually, at the end, we say that, you know, now we're managing five airports in Oman. Why don't we manage outside Oman? So after, you know, establishing ourselves and being strong in Oman, we would like to leave and uh, go even abroad. This is the house that you know, Tofia. <laughs> and uh, our main pillars in the uh, in the uh, house is uh, profitable growth. We just linked profit because we don't want to grow without you know, having profit because we need to make sure that our shareholders are happy. Uh, operation excellence and uh, enabling assets and engaging stakeholders. Major things that happened in, uh, in our industry is opening Salada Airport and uh, you know, launching the uh, five-year strategy. We actually changed our organization structure to actually suit the strategy that we built. And uh, we're doing a new branding. Plus, uh, last year, we doubled our profit. So it's 100% from uh, the year before. The opportunities. Well, uh, you know, building what, what you've seen uh, at the beginning, I think we have <coughs> uh, two sides of uh, uh, income and growth. We have. Uh, aeronautical uh, revenue and non-aeronautical. And uh, in the aeronautical revenue, we have the AMARO, uh, maintenance and uh, repair for aircrafts, where we floated, or we will float a tender this, uh, this month, and we are waiting for bidders to come. 
the ground handling. The, uh, the, the ground handling, actually, we used to have one uh, ground handler in Oman. And uh, tomorrow, actually, we're meeting with the board and uh, selecting a second ground handler. And it will be announced, inshallah, in uh, April. So, you know, we're trying to create markets. We, cr we try to, you know, liberalize the market and make, bring big players. You will be impressed. People were saying to us, like, you know, who's going to come to Oman? You know, uh, you have 10, 10 million passengers. Uh, you think you're going to attract, uh, you know, talent and, and uh, you know, big companies? I assure you, you will, you will hear the uh, news. In this month, we will announce, you know, one of the biggest players that uh, are doing ground handling in, in the world. They'll be, inshallah, working in Oman. We always try to uh, make sure that, you know, we, we uh, either, you know, have the same pace with the market or actually be a, a little bit innovative. So, uh, you know, there is always uh, certain demands in the airports. And uh, some people, especially with the special, uh, uh, you know, uh, flights and, and uh, uh, ha having their own uh, aircrafts, you know, they wanted special treatments. And we're, tr we're trying to introduce that also as, uh, as a limousine service and, and so on and so forth. We had a very good uh, discussion and, and uh, 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 advert with, uh, with uh, uh, duty-free companies. And uh, thank God we selected, uh, you know, a very well-esteemed uh, duty-free company for the uh, new airport. For the existing airport, uh, you know, there was a study done and, uh, uh, you know, there were many uh, uh, ideas whether we keep it as a shopping mall or, or what, what we should do with it. And, and actually, the final uh, verdict was to keep it as a low-cost terminal. So this existing airport will be T2 and the new will be T1. Uh, those are the lands that we're going to build in Masqat Airport. And uh, this is the new structure that we uh, made. And this is Salala Airport, new Salala, which is opened last year. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, uh, Ayman. And it's uh, one of those things that's, I think, very important uh, about what you did, because this is a practical case. This is a real company. This is a live example. So maybe Hai and, and, and Deepak, you could address this. The tension between or the support and between the government and the private sector. Can one succeed without the other? Um, and if, if we put the innovation burden on the private sector or the government, uh, are we bound to, to fail? Yeah, thank you. Let me just let Haya or Deepak take sure. that if that's okay. Yeah, okay, so um, I think, uh, you know, various uh, governments are also being uh, innovative. Uh, I mean, you look at the UAE, you have a Minister for Happiness, Minister for Tolerance, Minister for Youth. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, uh, forward-looking in, in uh, that sense. So uh, I, I think there's a, there's a symbiotic uh, relationship between the, the private sector and the government. In, in the past, um, you know, the governments have been the main uh, uh, job uh, absorbers. But uh, given the, the growing population, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the constraints on their finances, uh, it, it, it can't uh, continue. I think there's something like 75 million uh, new jobs need to be created in this region uh, by 2020. Mm -hmm. And it, it ain't happening without the private sector. Hi, did you want to add something to that? I think at this uh, <coughs> early stage of development, it's extremely important that the <coughs> private sector and the government work together. The the role of the government, however, is has to be focused on uh, policy creation and reform that, that can enable the existence of the private sector without the government support in the future. So we're aiming for a future uh, stage where the government is not as involved as it should be right now. Great. Okay, let's go back uh, to the, let's go to the audience and we'll come back uh, to the panelists. So if we have questions in the audience, if we can bring them uh, a mic. We have one uh, over here, and then the one up here. Yes. And just, if you could stand up and introduce yourself. 
Thank you, um, distinguished panelist. And uh, I'd like to pose a question to Sheikh Ayman. Just before I do that, I'd like to pay a, a small tribute to uh, Ms. Haya for actually capturing one of the uh, uh, facts that I really believe is, is the most uh, relevant uh, uh, when it comes to uh, pushing innovation. Uh, the statement that you made was that you, you really have to have a uh, government support or a high entity support to, for small sectors, small and medium enterprises, so they can basically push forward into innovation, something to that extent. <laughs> um, my question is uh, for Sheikh Ayman is that uh, you are in the envious uh, position now. You just have finalized your strategy for the next uh, uh, five years or so. And uh, you have done, uh, and, and congratulations on the milestones you have done. Uh, my question is, I have not seen uh, what you have done for the small and medium enterprises. And I'm not talking about people that who should just open a small gift shop in the uh, airport. You are in the perfect position to allow small and medium enterprises to develop from now until you reach your vision of uh, five years in segments that are a lot more, um, how can I say, um, more influential than just uh, reselling gifts. For example, in providing electronic equipment to the uh, installations in the airport, um, actually developing themselves into uh, caterers or you know something of much bigger impact rather than just having a small uh, sales. So my question to you is how many small and medium enterprises you already have registered for these uh, services. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, to answer you uh, um, uh, from where you ended, I don't know the number today, uh, but I can uh, recall it and uh, send it to you. Uh, for SMEs, actually we have a good uh, percentage of, uh, uh, of our strategy uh, that belongs to SMEs. You know that SMEs is, uh, uh, is a product that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, pushed and, and uh, uh, taken in, in, uh, from from the government to to uh, you know to uh, introduce SMEs and push them and, and give them a certain stake uh, in the marketplace. Uh, we actually have uh, you know certain uh, percentages for them, where, whether it is retail or you know other segments, uh, you know, like name it, like you know. Uh, 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 funding and 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 and, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, giving them a certain uh, level of uh, you know push even where we actually join hand to hand with them and make sure that they even succeed so in all uh, uh, aspects we uh, have a certain segment for SMEs we know that they cannot you know uh, uh, race with uh, you know big international companies that's why we always give them a, uh, some weight to make them you know uh, get there but but just to uh, uh, be frank with you I can even give you more information if you send me your email address and I'll uh, I'll tell you where do, does SME stand uh, in our strategy great uh, Golam it was uh, interesting um, my name is Gulam Amarsi. I'm the president of the HBS Club of the uh, GCC, the Harvard Business School Club of the GCC. Um, and I'll allow myself to, take, to pose two small questions. The first one is for uh, Haya. Um, governments, uh, when you mentioned as an example that the government is uh, setting up incubators and so forth, I don't think government should be there. Government should... Uh, give an infrastructure to a private incubator operator to, to run their show and allow them to, to do that. So I'm wondering if the public sector should be even going there. My second question, if you allow me, is uh, for Sheikh Ayman. Um, I, I applaud uh, when someone takes the low-tech route to innovate. I think we are all dreaming in Technicolor and saying that we will have the next Bill Gates coming from this region. We're not there yet. We will have, inshallah, uh, later. But innovation sh should start at the low-tech level. And what you have done with your employees and your staff coming up with new ideas is exactly what we should do. Unfortunately, we don't give, we, there's no glamour in that. And no one does that. No one talks about that. So can the panel answer uh, or 
you know, see what, what needs to be done more, maybe give glamour to low-tech uh, initiatives perhaps, as opposed to the high-tech dreams that will never happen? Great, so maybe Haya, you could take the first one, and then Ayman, you can obviously take the second one. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think that government should run incubators. Government should enable entrepreneurs to operate in the country smoothly. So the government should work hand in hand with accelerators and incubators to understand what are the real challenges that entrepreneurs face in the registration of their companies in the ability to bid for government projects in the ability of um, getting specific permits that's that's I think the role of the government in changing policy and working together with entrepreneurs and, um, and incubators to, to provide a better environment for those companies to exist so that I think is the main role of the government in, in supporting uh, innovative uh, and also regular SMEs uh, in general. We do have some examples in Qatar where there is a 100% government run incubator, um, semi government, and NGOs funded by the government. And this is mainly our way of experimenting what really works in our context run programs in, in the States, and I've done that here. I cannot take 100% what I've done in, in Boston and replicate it in Qatar. The, the local context, the, uh, the local environment completely is completely different. However, the needs of startups are pretty much the same. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ghulam. Uh, uh, you're totally right. And, uh, you know, those schemes that we did, are actually targeting those uh, kind of segments and uh, we always uh, would like to appreciate that you know they come up uh, front and, and we try to support and, and uh, uh, you know make sure that they're always being listened to uh, there are some uh, even ideas that uh, you know uh, the uh, low tech as, as you mentioned uh, came up with and, and we try to even fine-tune them and make them you know workable because sometimes you know uh, they come up with some ideas where actually there is no ROI on, on uh, you know the, the uh, you know implementing them, but we always make sure that you know appreciation, recognition, uh, you know uh, highlighting uh, certain issues and, and, and trying to fine tune and, and implement, and actually you know the main uh, pillar is always like you know you uh, uh, you don't say that you know this staff member or that person is not good. It's actually you need to. Uh, be uh, on the other side and you say like I didn't train him well I didn't give him the chance I didn't uh, make him uh, you know uh, uh, be innovative because I actually make sure that you know he punches his you know finger at 730 and he leaves at 330 well what does he do in the middle I mean is 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 the main thing to punch in and punch out or it is what is the main thing like what what do you do in the middle of punching so uh, yes, I uh, uh, put my vote to yours, and, and, and yes, we're doing our best, and, and uh, we always listen to any ideas. I'm actually coming here today even to listen and, and to, to uh, learn something and, and probably can implement later on. We have a few hands up. Um, let me take a, a couple at the same time. Let me take uh, two of these, uh, these three questions first. They're here, there's two young ladies and, and a young gentleman there. Maybe they can ask their three questions um, at the same time and then we'll come back over here in the front. Hi, I'm Fatma, I'm the Vice President of the Columbia Alumni Association of Oman and I'm also a global shaper at the World Economic Forum. My question is for Sheikh Ayman. I truly applaud the steps that you have allowed to implement at the OAMC regarding innovation, especially job swap, I think it's quite creative. Uh, my question to you is that, first of all, a little bit of context. I think, in my personal opinion, the hardest part about innovation for any economy is actually changing the mindset of people to embrace the concept of innovation. So what would you recommend 
for both the public and the private sector of Oman. What can they do to change the mindset of people in concrete steps for them to actually embrace innovation? Assalamu oh, alaikum. Okay. My name is Mohammed Al Mulla, part of Bank Muscat Investment uh, Banking. Uh, I saw there ala qadr ahl al az al azm taati al azaimu. As per our internal inspiration or if uh, requirements, the outcome reach. And uh, H E Yusuf bin Alaw mentioned about the 22 countries, Arab countries gathering, and the the idea that came to structure. Uh, and out uh, to structure an income to all of these Arab countries through the custom uh, structure product, which will give $600 million that will support some uh, uh, Arabic uh, economy or weak economy. We are talking a lot about uh, innovations, creative. We are sharing our feelings as Arab people. We are sharing the, the painful side. But when it's come to implementing a real innovation and a creative sort of actions, we don't see it. Okay. So what is your views in terms of implementation, some uh, a practical actions, innovative actions, in real life? OK, great. So practical uh, applications. Then we had one more question behind you. What are you? Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, several of you cited education as the cornerstone of an innovative economy, and I thank you for that. As a former student at the Graduate School of Education, I too believe in that. Um, in a past life, I worked at a prominent museum here in the region, and I worked in the education department where I was tasked with cultivating critical thinking and debate at the museum. To share with you an anecdote, uh, a group of researchers came into the museum asking to do uh, a study, a theoretical study, of how the art fell from various Islamic empires. The fact that we were acknowledging uh, that there were Sunnis, there were Shias, that there were other groups was a bit too contentious for the museum. My question to you is that is it a bit too preemptive to be talking about innovative economies if we don't have freedom of debate and thought? Great, great. So we have three questions, uh, kind of different. So we have a mindset question. How do we change mindset? So maybe, Ayman, you could, you could address that. We have uh, practical uh, options. You know, how do we practically do implementation? And we have the issue of, is freedom a prerequisite for, for innovation? So why don't we start with you, uh, Ayman, just quickly, because we have a shortage of time, okay. and then we'll go to the other sure. two questions. Uh, thank you, Fatma. I think uh, uh, changing the mindset is easy. And uh, there is always a solution for any problem. This is as far as I know. Uh, and uh, I don't want anyone to, uh, to uh, actually uh, you know, be disappointed. Unfortunately, in the Arab uh, countries, we have a very bad education system. So if we want to uh, you know, uh, make sure that we you know, share innovation, we build innovation, uh, we need to make sure that we concentrate on the education system. You know, I'm not saying all of our schools are bad, but I'm saying that, you know, we need to build and we need to make sure that youngsters who go to school, to grade one, they should get the right dosage till, uh, you know, they grow up. So uh, this is one. The, thing, the other thing is that we need to make sure that we, uh, you know, don't let down people. So like, you know, if, if your child comes to you and, 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 you know, gives a crazy idea, you need to support him. You need to make sure that, you know, you listen to him, uh, you know, uh, that, that you actually, uh, uh, you know, feel for him and, and, and you support. And last but not least is negativity. You know, we need to shrink the negativity. You know, uh, if, if you see nowadays, if you have, you know, social media, what's up, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, those kind of social medias. You know, if you say something and you mean something else, people will just attack you. I was just uh, looking at uh, one of my friends yesterday tweeting, uh, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, some, uh, some uh, words, and, and people just ate him alive. So, you know, I mean, uh, you need always to look at the positive side of it, you know, the, the bright side of it. Don't go and look at the negative side of it. Having an optimistic uh, mindset and 
giving margin for error. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. So Haya, on the practical options, a practical way of, of impl uh, implementing or reaching innovation. Um. If I understand your question correctly, uh, you're, you're asking how, how we can <coughs> practically support innovators and um, help them in the implementation of their, of their uh, innovation enterprise. We, we have a case where a group of researchers came up with a disaster management software where they can crowdsource, uh, in, uh, crowdsource the uh, information about the level of disaster happening in uh, affected areas. And that's, it has a beautiful um, impact for disaster management, but then if we are going for an economic value, we want, we want to see how, how we can extract the best um, economic value from this idea. So we, we help this company by understanding what is the demand for this uh, crowdsourcing disaster management. Realize that insurance companies are very interested in learning where is the most effect affected area to help manage how they can allocate their resources. As soon as this group of researchers came up with uh, generated interest in insurance companies, that's when we went, went ahead and uh, supported the, the product development financially and with connections and mentorship. So if there is opportunity, you will get the support, uh, the practical support needed for the development of those ideas. Great, and uh, Deepak, do you want to take the easiest question that was asked about freedom uh, before innovation? Yeah, I guess uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we were talking about uh, the economy and the innovation, and there's a few uh, items there that uh, need work. Uh, one is uh, to, to get more uh, investment going, uh, because we need to create the jobs. Um, you know, there's a predictable rule of law, there's freedom of movement of ideas and people and goods across borders. Uh, there is uh, the need for infrastructure, for example, uh, technology infrastructure, and finally access to capital. And I think, uh, you know, I'm referred to it, there's, there's uh, you know, change is happening and uh, there is uh, growing uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, just because of, of the social media uh, aspect. Uh, it's it's uh, getting difficult to put the genie back in the bottle. And uh, for example, in this region, you expect to have about uh, 140 million uh, people uh, on the internet. So I think, uh, you know, we have to be patient, but, uh, you know, stay the course. Thanks. We had a Hello. final question uh, up here in the front. Here or here? Oh, you already have a mic. Wow. <laughs> Me too. Very innovative. <laughs> okay. Uh, so very quick, final two questions because we, we will have to end in two minutes. Okay. Okay. My name is Matasim Sultan, uh, the founder of Energy Experience. I actually was one of the people mentioned in the book mentioned by uh, Mohammed Ardi in the morning. Arabs Unseen, I was one of them. So thank you. Um, just, just before before asking the question, I'd like to put things into context. Okay, but very quickly, because yeah, we really quickly, yes, definitely yes. It's what you will have is a room full of people who want to eat lunch, so okay. they might take their uh, consequences. But please go ahead. Okay. In order for us as an Arab nation to practically have innovation as a culture, we need to take a step back and look at the global competitive index. If we look into that, we'll see that innovation is the tip of the iceberg, or, or innovation is the icing on the cake. So the pillars be, uh, under innovation are infrastructure, proper, clear macroeconomic environment, health care, primary education, and all of that. Now my question is, does Oman or the Arab nation have the proper infrastructure or the proper pillars to have innovation as a culture? Okay, great. Thank Good you. question. And last question right here in the front. If you could please give him a mic very quickly. Right here. Very quickly, he's had his hand up.
My name is Suleiman Al Harthi. My question is to Sheikh Ayman. First of all, I just would like to join my hands with Fatma to applaud you on this uh, swap job uh, thing. I think it's a wonderful idea and it takes a lot of courage to actually do it. But uh, you'll have to be very careful when you do it because you might end up, uh, you know, as a fire uh, man for, forever. I've seen another picture of viewers uh, sweeping the floor, so I know that's wonderful. My question is, in your presentation, you mentioned that you plan to put the airport in the world map and compete with the world uh, airports. Do you really have the infrastructure and the people, the setup, and the, to actually achieve your ambitions? And if you don't have, uh, how will you be able to put the airport, as you mentioned, I think, in the top 20? Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, why don't I turn to you very quickly, if you could answer both questions, I think they're related to each other. Do you have the requisite kind of infrastructure for this innovation and push? Yes, uh, thank you, Suleiman. I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the government have paid, uh, you know, a, a big uh, bill for, uh, for building those airports. Uh, this is one pillar. The other pillar is that, you know, we're trying to build the talent, uh, the talent in, uh, inside the company, and we uh, are always uh, attracting talent from uh, all over the sector. Uh, by headhunting. We uh, also uh, uh, have good talent from all uh, airports that we actually also headhunt. So, you know, uh, uh, in order to succeed, you need to have, you know, talent within the company, in, inside the organization. And uh, after you do that, you need to have a good roadmap and uh, certain goals. Uh, uh, as, you, as you just rightly said, you know, we had uh, a very uh, uh, a bit ambitious goal to be 20 and today we are 96. But I think, you know, uh, if you actually have a target and, and you follow this target and you don't just do the plan, the strategy, and you shelf oriented, you know, just put it on the shelves, you need always to revisit and make sure that, you know, you're doing good or you're behind or you're hopefully, you know, uh, upfront. Plus, uh, you know, you always need to uh, fine tune your strategy. So, like what we uh, what we ever built for 2018 might change because you know today with the circumstances we have, we think that 2018 is 2018. We we evolved there, but uh, later on we might think uh, you know we need to re revamp or do a certain you know fine tuning. So uh, yes, uh, we need to get talent in order to uh, start uh, you know running and playing drums. Great, uh, thank you, Ayman. And you know, as we wrap up this uh, panel and discussion, you know, we had some great points from the panelists, but also from the audience. And a couple of just the key takeaways, you know, there was this focus on the, not just the high tech and the glamour, but the low tech and really the practical on the ground realities of innovation. There was a lot of discussion about allowing for a margin of error, allowing for there to be a uh, air of positivity for people who are bringing forward ideas from a young age uh, all the way through the workplace. And I think one point that was hit on by the last few questions and by Noura is this notion of freedom, of infrastructure, of the enabling environment. And we have this great title here, Innovation Inspiring a New Arab World. And we're trying to say, let's put ideas out there. There's a lot of negativity. But let's think of what the great ideas are that are happening, what is possible. And I would say that sometimes there are great examples that are succeeding here in Oman, in the region uh, at large, in spite of these many challenges. And our job today is not to forget that these challenges exist, is to think through how we overcome them, because they're very real. And actually the potential that's being reached today, while amazing, especially when we look at the examples today, could be that much higher. And I want to thank our great panelists for being those examples of innovation in their own lives and their own institutions. Thank you very much, Haya. Thank you very much, Deepak. Thank you very much, Sheikh Ayman. Thank you.